Kiana and Jim O'Hara here. Oops, we got things falling all over the place here. Um, let me see. Yeah, so in one second, I'll be able to see the title, which is always a good starting point, really. Yes, borderlines and codependence, toxic relationships, trauma bonds, no healthy love. So, I'm not saying people with codependency are the same as people with BPD. But what happens when they come together in a relationship <clears throat> is that the effect is that it really exacerbates or increases, doesn't help, somebody's codependency, which maybe they know they have, maybe they don't know they have. And for people with BPD... They're wanting and trying to have relationships, but they're not capable of love. They're not capable of intimacy. They're not capable of mutuality and reciprocity. And all these things are can be somewhat compromised in many a codependent, but not to the same degree. And all these things are necessary to have healthy love. And so the trauma bond becomes a dynamic as I talked about, I think, in a video something like 11 years ago now, or maybe it's nine years ago, but I can't remember the exact title, but it was something like, I used the term probably in the beginning, I coined it, the dance of this, which is, you know, well used now, the dance of codependency with those with BPD, because people with BPD have codependency too, unless maybe it's more severely impacted. But the important thing, I think I did a video, like I said, nine or 10 or 11 years ago, that was where non-borderlines and borderlines meet in especially significant other relationships is in the dance of codependency, is in what becomes that trauma bond of a relationship that in terms of healthy love or it being healthy is a relationship that is impossible, actually, and, and just not very healthy. So having said that, what am I looking at here? Yes. Having said that, I know as I'm starting to get more comments on my last video that there might be a lot of questions about that. And people are trying to start to defend against that what I said in borderlines uh, don't, can't, and will not love you and haven't loved you. As a lot of people think, mm, I'm confusing that with narcissism or something, but I'm not confusing it with anything. So, um, I age am borderline and I don't have a sense of self, I guess. I'm in love with a narcissist. Oh, okay. We have a typical NPD BPD relationship. I haven't heard from him in a month. Anyway, should I cut him? And you said out of my life or oh, out of my life, or should I do what I plan to do, which is move closer to him so we can spend more time together? Well, I don't know how you're planning to move closer to him. When you haven't heard from him, you said, in quite a while. And it's, for somebody who has BPD, the last person on earth you want to try to quote love, or you think you quote love, um, you, as a person with BPD, are aligning with a person who's going to traumatize you even more than people with BPD can, or you know, as much, if not more, than people with BPD can traumatize people with codependency. People that don't have, quote, personality disorders. So a lot of people with BPD do end up in relationships with narcissists. But what's really untrue about a lot stated out there, I've seen it all over the place online, that, you know, oh, the quiet borderline will just eat the narcissist for lunch. No, no such thing happens like that. Whenever somebody with BPD is in a relationship with a narcissist, and I respect that, Clover, Sale, you're saying you feel you love him, but you're mistaking love for something else there. And the thing is, when people with BPD get with narcissists like anybody else, they're going to be decimated, abused, traumatized, re-injured on top of being, re being traumatized from childhood, and those relationships never work out. They're not healthy. There's no healthy love in that either. So people with BPD, I can well appreciate, aren't all the same. Secondly, people with BPD often use the word love and no disrespect intended to anybody, but might not know what that actually means. 
and not intellectually, but emotionally. So I think I'll just start by saying traumatic bonding, right? It, it occurs as a result of ongoing cycles of abuse. This is definitely going to happen between somebody with BPD and a narcissist. Definitely going to happen with somebody with codependency and a person with BPD. So in these cycles of abuse that are ongoing in this trauma or traumatic bonding, it's based on, or what kind of fuels it, for lack of a better way to put it, is intermittent reinforcement of like a reward and then a punishment followed quickly after a reward. It creates emotional, powerful unhealthy though emotional bonds and they can be very resistant to change and can i just say before i go any further maybe you can tell me clover sale since you're the only one um saying anything right now is the sound okay this time because i want to make sure the sound is good from the beginning you said can a narcissist be in love with anyone no absolutely not nada never no or at least one person more than others no no because as the myth of Narcissus goes, they can only be in love with themselves. But then we all know that's not even love. They don't love themselves. Narcissists, like people with BPD, until unless they get, well, a lot of treatment and find a self, in various different ways to varying different degrees. Narcissists are living through a false self. People with BPD are living through a false self. That doesn't make them the same or synonymous. But narcissists don't love anybody. They can, they can turn on the charm the verb, and they can show you what they want to show you to hook you, right? To, to target you. But that's not love either any more than when a borderline person with BPD is mirroring and idealizing and in a codependent way, people pleasing someone to get into relationship with someone. Well, that's not love either. It just feels so darn good in both cases, but it feels it's too good to be true. So I'm just wondering if my sound is coming through okay. Could somebody just tell me, please? Yes, I hope. And, um, oh, you said the sound is fine. Okay, I didn't see that. Thank you. Uh, hi, Rab. How are you? You said sound is good, AJ. Oh, good. Thank you. I guess I got to read before I, yeah. Um, he said, it's pour, is it pouring where you are? Thunderstorms down here in Brampton. <laughs> I'm sorry that every time you mention Brampton, I have to giggle a little. No, no offense, Rab. Brampton is a weird city. Um, where I'm at right now, we had uh, the sun out earlier with thunder banging, you know, thunder and lightning, but no rain. Now it's clouded over. I think it's rained, uh, but currently we're not having a thunderstorm. So I know that there's predicted severe thunderstorms for a lot of parts of Ontario tonight. So hopefully, it, ho hopefully. I'm hoping if it's going to come here that it comes here when I'm done the stream in case it interferes with power. Or internet right so um but i guess you're getting it where you are right now so we might get it in a little while clover sale how do i develop a sense of self well i'm yeah uh therapy long-term therapy and i'm gonna do to your latest comment that i answered before i got here about a half an hour ago to so live stream i said i will answer what is the lack of self in bpd etc in a video because I couldn't type it all out in a response to a comment. So when you ask how do I develop a sense of self, the answer is through therapy and long-term therapy, and preferably in a psychodynamic modality. So you're not going to be able to do it on your own. So where was I here with this? Yes, intermittent re reinforcement, cycles of abuse, reward punishment, creates this powerful emotional bondedness, often between codependents and, and uh, people with BPD, as well as people with BPD with narcissists. But uh, so what that's about, right, comes originally from Patrick Carnes. And if I'm not mistaken, he wrote the book, The Betrayal Bond. I'm pretty sure about that. I'm not 100% sure. But he developed the term to describe misuse of fear, excitement, and sexual feelings and sexual physiology to entangle another person. Now, will a narcissist target you to do this to you on purpose? Yes. But that's not what people with BPD are doing. They're not seducing you. They're not inducing you. They're not persuading you or forcing you. They're showing you an aspect of what is an otherwise not known self 
Due to the fact that so many people with BPD have been sexually abused in childhood, many, not all, become hypersexual. And then the next thing you know, so you're meeting this person with BPD, and I'm not sure if the men are as hypersexual, but, but I don't think that's a problem for men as women. But you're meeting the person with BPD, and of course, like Patrick Karn said, right, then tra trauma bonding, traumatic bonding, he coined the term and or the betrayal bond, which I think is his book, if I'm not mistaken. It's the misuse of fear, excitement, sexual feelings, and sexual physiology to entangle another person. But let me make it clear. Nobody entangles anybody against their will, right? People might not know what they're getting into, but people like what they're experiencing. This from somebody with BPD in the idealization, mirroring, and the codependent part of BPD, people-pleasing phase, and narcissists are targeting. And so um, another way to put this definition is that traumatic bonding is a strong emotional attachment between an abused person and or his abuser. And it's, it well, it can be formed as a result of a cycle of violence, but often that happens sometimes. But often it's more about what each person, the person with BPD, the person with codependency, where they're at with themselves, people with BPD not knowing who they are, unless until a lot of therapy and or getting close to, if not recovered. And codependents might know a lot about who they are, but then relationally speaking, might not know themselves as well in that area. So this term fractionation is, is sort of conversational or interpersonally moving the target from one feeling to its opposite. So a target refers more to those with NPD because people with BPD usually are just too disorganized in general, let, let alone the disorganized attachment and that they can't attach. So they might be trying to avoid loneliness, etc., cetera, as, as they're idealizing and mirroring you. The fractionation of interpersonally moving a person from one feeling to its opposite and back again, which doesn't happen with people with BP and idealization. They don't take you to the devaluation at the beginning, usually. But this in its course, um, in order to increase bonding is, well, it's related to some things that don't really matter here, but bonding is a biological occurrence related to emotions that makes people more important to each other and is influenced by time spent together. Or in the case of a codependent meeting somebody with BPD, maybe not much time spent at all together, but more to the point of the fear and or the excitement, sexual feelings, and sexual physiology of everything that is way too good to be true, but that's just way so good in the beginning. So unhealthy or traumatic bonding occurs between people in a relationship that maybe in the beginning isn't, depends on the narcissist, it could be right from the get-go, but an abusive relationship. And the bond gets stronger for people who've grown up in abusive households, and that's not just necessarily people with BPD or even narcissists, but a lot of people with codependency. Because it seems in part, quote, normal. The conflict. And for those with codependency, people with BPD don't know themselves. Many of them come from, you know, I really believe, you know, not just me. There's a lot of um, clinicians out there pioneering this. BPD is in at least 75% of cases, a response to trauma, no matter what American psychiatry wants to call it. And so people with BPD are traumatized and have been victimized, but they don't have a sense of self. They've lost that to the emotional rest of development. So they continue on getting a year older every year, getting somewhat intellectually smarter, but their emotional intelligence isn't growing. And they don't have that self that got obliterated by the emotional arrested development. And so people with codependency don't experience um, trauma as, as deep or wounding as that, but various differing levels of trauma that really impact, you know, things that really matter in interpersonal relating, like self-worth, self-esteem, um, or, or even in knowing oneself. People with codependency often, to one degree or another, come out of their family of origin and they might not know themselves as well as they think they do. Now, many people with codependency, and I've had many clients say this to me, I know who I am. 
And the next thing they'll go to is what they do. The career they have, the profession they're in, the job they do. And they know that, but in interpersonal relating, it's not the same. So, you know, the longer a relationship continues, when it's maybe not abusive yet, but it's going to start to give people that, you know, it, it in the course of the dynamic that develops, people with BPD are going to, when they start splitting, that after the idealization phase, then they're going to be taking people from one wonderful feeling to one really opposite, not wonderful feeling, to say the least. And this, the longer that goes on back and forth, the intermittent reinforcement and then the punishment and the pain, the more difficult it is for people to leave the abuser with whom they have bonded. To be trail bond, it's a trauma bond because you get absolutely addicted in the beginning to the physiology, the hypersexuality, the sexuality, the excitement, the intensity, all of these things are precursors, actually. They can be, well, they can be described as, but people don't often realize it in the beginning, <clears throat> that people have, whether they have BPD or you're the codependent, people have already from childhood learned some degree, varying degrees of familiarity with conflict, familiarity with having to fight for what one needs or pursue for what one needs or in the case of codependence overgive um rescue you know fix uh, try to fix and change and help and and all that wonderful not so wonderful stuff and so a victim may disclose the abuse often they just start to tell people at bpd will start to tell you on the first date about their abuse or other abuse in their life and family of origin the trauma bond means that the victim may wish to receive comfort from the very person who abused them, or often it's that they want, they're seeking comfort from somebody that, in the case of BP, they're likely to be abusing, whether it's intentional or not. And people with codependency aren't looking really to abuse, but can get into overreactivity easily when there's no mutuality and reciprocity. And so this just sets up this terrible dance of what becomes a dynamic, not really fit, of the trauma bonding between codependents and people with BPD and or narcissists. But this is why there is, so I want to say, first of all, people with BPD have the greater issue around inability to love. And I mean, they can't love in a healthy, congruent, consistent way at all if they get to love fleetingly somehow. Or something that looks like love. It's not healthy love. But people with codependency have some, often have some degree of what's happened in your childhood where, where the roots of codependency lie. This is not the old definition of codependency, by the way. Because that's out the window. We know more than that now. And so the thing about that is, then the love of people with codependency is not entirely healthy either because it is so self-abandoning, so self-diminishing, so self-annihilating at times, it can't be healthy. And then it can never be good enough for the person with BPD or for the narcissist. So I don't want to say that the only reason these relationships don't work out or that they're trauma bonded or that the love is not healthy and that they're toxic relationships I'm not assigning equality here, but people with BPD or narcissists are going to have more to do with that. But codependents have a piece of that responsibility as well. Well, yeah, I'd, I'd rather people don't bring Sam Backman in here, but um, you said Sam Backman said that when a borderline leaves their partner, they completely forget about the partner like they don't exist. Well, that's true for some people. The out of sight, out of mind reality, which goes back to the trauma of early childhood and how that was experienced. And I experienced the exact same way by everybody with BPD. And you said, I find I obsess over partners when we separate. What do you think? Well, I think that each person with BPD is an individual. So I don't know. I think for some people, like yourself, you're saying you obsess about the partner. Some people with BPD do that. And some people with BPD don't do that. 
and it's out of sight, out of mind, gone, done. And that would be the difference between people that will hoover and people that won't hoover, ever. Well, yeah, and if you're addicted to him, and you said a lot of it's sexual, and he's toxic, just know that's not, quote, love, unquote, at all. And you said, yes, I want comfort from the abuser after the abuse. Well, so do codependents want comfort from people with BPD that are abusing them after the abuse. And this fits right in with what I was just going to say next anyway, which, oh, but yeah, Stockholm Syndrome, okay, which never mind where it comes from, some, you know, something happened in Stockholm, okay, um, a long time ago now, but the Stockholm Syndrome is a psychological, psychological condition, sorry, that occurs when a victim of abuse identifies and attaches or bonds to or with the abuser. This syndrome, well, yeah, it was originally observed in hostages who were kidnapped, and then uh, they not only, in Stockholm, Sweden, I believe, they were not only bonded with their kidnappers, but also fell in love with them. And that is, by the way, this trauma bonding happens often in childhood for people with BPD. Like, I would give my own example of when I was, you know, first arrived in the world, and I don't know what was happening, to a borderline narcissistic comorbid mother and everything went awry with attachment, believe me, I felt like we had no attachment. But to an infant looking at mother, the first love object, the original object, or as Bradshaw says, the face, the mother's face is the world to the infant. No bond is a trauma bond. And, 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 any other degree of bonding, if it exists, is still like there's different types of attachment, but it's interrupted attachment. And in my case, it was like no attachment. So, and that's why people with BPD end up with, at best, at best, disorganized attachment. Because sometimes people with BPD really don't have or fit into a style of attachment because the approach avoidance conflict is kind of like never mind calling it disorganized attachment, I've said before, it's rather like in place of attachment. And it means they're never going to get to attachment, approach, feel fear of engulfment, got to push away, then fear of abandonment, want to pull you back in. But it goes on and on and it's vacillations from one end to the other to the other. There's nothing in the middle. And why is that? Because the emotion, emotional arrested development for people with BPD before or by the age of two <clears throat> means that they do not progress emotionally and their otherwise burgeoning authentic self that gets psychologically killed by abandonment trauma and other trauma as that's, I didn't word it in the exact phraseology, but a quote from the mother of object relations, Melanie Klein, then what happens is they do not get, so they get this emotion, emotional arrested development before, around the time of what's known as the reproachment phase, reproachment, I should be able to do something in Francais a little bit better than that, that phase of development, which is wherein a child will start to build autonomy and separateness, and it is the stage of early childhood development known as separation individuation. And people with BPD get arrested before this stage of development. So they don't separate and they don't individuate and they've lost themselves. So there's no way to attach. There's no way to know how to attach. There's no way to be able to withstand. Because you see, attachment for people with BPD who've had this early childhood trauma, not only interrupted attachment, not anywhere near a secure attachment, that's for sure. They can't, they have no reference whatsoever without a self. That lost self to the emotional arrested development. They don't get to separation individuation. So they, they don't know the difference between themselves and other at all. And that's why there's the merging and the trying to get identity through others. But without separation individuation, well, there is no self there at that time for people with BPD. And that has to be, you know, found again in through rigorous and long-term therapy on an emotional level and what all that entails. 
And unless until somebody does that, they're not going to know how to love because they, they haven't even gotten through separation individuation, which usually happens kind of toward the end of two into the age of three. And when I was in recovery, I probably got through in uh, therapy, separation individuation in my late 20s. So as I was taken into that process, which is really daunting and, and, and uh, difficult to do, I actually was able to start growing, get to know myself in therapy, but didn't get through separation individuation, which I should have got through it, to, you know, like just after two to three until I was like 28 or 29 years old. So that has a big impact. And people with BPD may feel like they love, but they don't. I don't mean to. I mean, people with BPD are so intellectually smart. But on the emotional intelligence level, it's not the same. And that's where people with BPD mistake what they think in their head or intellectually believe they're aware of. But the reality that they just don't have the self, haven't separated, individuated. And for people with codependency, it's usually a rather insecure style of attachment that may happen too. Could be a little bit more secure, but it's not likely to be 100% secure attachment. But the wound doesn't really have to occur. Often doesn't occur that early for people with codependency. That's rooted in woundedness that may well happen after the age of five, which means that's a big stark difference as to why codependents have codependency and not BPD or NPD. And so then what happens with that, though, is so people might have separation individuation. Yes, many codependents. They, they know who they are. They are separate. They have ego boundaries of that's that person, I'm me, which people with BPD don't have. But they also have been, for lack of a better way to put it, programmed by their experience, whatever their trauma or whatever their woundedness was about, to overgive. Often they're parentified. Often, so there's injunctions in family systems, which I'm not going to go into wholly here, but injunctions are things that are the family rules that teach children how to behave or not behave. And one of them is don't grow up. Another one is don't be yourself. Another one is like, don't talk, don't feel. These are the injunctions in dysfunctional families of origin. So people with codependency, there's some dysfunction, but it might not involve as many injunctions or be as across the spectrum scale of what is really traumatizing to children as what's in narcissistic dysfunctional families of origin or families of origin that are pretty rife with people with BPD or parents with BPD or NPD or more. So the Stockholm syndrome is really a big part of this as well. Oh, Clover said, I'm pretty old and I'm single. Never been um, married or engaged and have no friends. Something is wrong with me. Well, something really happened to you and, and you need treatment and therapy to find yourself again. And so there's something that's really, quote, wrong with you, unquote, is that you don't know who you are and you don't have a, a, a self from which to relate to others. And Clover was asked if she's, he or she's ever been through therapy. I always try to get identity through partners. I just sort of go where they go and do what they do and live vicariously through them. Yes, which is what I'm describing. And um, you said you did go for therapy, but it didn't help. And then um, Susie Q asked, um, do you know who you are? And Clover asked, what does that mean? And I guess uh, Clover's answer of a month was, that's maybe how long you were in therapy. Hi, Wheels, how are you doing? And then Clover said, I was discouraged to talk or show emotion or make any noise or have any unique ideas. Yeah, so those were the injunctions I was just referring to that are like, dysfunctional family rules and like don't talk don't feel don't grow up don't be you there's a whole lot of other ones too don't do this don't do this don't do the other thing and the way that they get enforced by family is like if you're a child in a family like that with all these injunctions and, and all these don't rules nobody's going to say to you don't do this don't do that it's just implied because they don't do it they don't get it they don't because often people have cluster b parents like i did and so when I tried to talk about my feelings as a young kid and beyond in my family of origin, it was like, I mean, every time I would mention anything, like if we were out at a restaurant, my father would just get up from the table and go to the bathroom. He just wasn't even going to hear it. 
and my mother would just tune out. And so there was, there was nothing ever coming back. And I pursued them for a while, you know, from being a young child into my adolescence and maybe a little beyond. I pursued trying to get something from them, but then I realized it didn't work. And it wasn't behavior that I, I, I wasn't a pursuer after that point when I gave up on them, which was really a healthy thing. But then I had to go to therapy and figure it all out, help get out to figure it all out. Uh, well, if you're in therapy for a month and it didn't work, um, then, you know, you need to try again because often it takes many different, um, you know, attempts to find a good fit for you and to find somebody who can really help you. It, it's, it's sad to say, but it's true. Well, and you said you weren't allowed to cry. Well, yeah, that's pretty damaging to a child. I mean, I'm doing all right. Thanks for asking. Oh, you're welcome. And so I think this idea that, you know, I just want to make sure people understand it's different in each relationship, but people with codependency in a relationship with somebody with BPD, that trauma bond and what's really going on there in these toxic relationships is maybe more largely on the part <clears throat> of the person with BPD who doesn't know who they are. But people with codependency bring a certain percentage, and nobody can really measure that accurately. Maybe it's 75, 25. Maybe it's 80, 20. Who knows? But maybe it's like 70, 30. But people with codependency bring an element of their own proclivity, for lack of a better way to put it, unbeknownst to them, to want to engage, not want to, but to engage and be involved in something that is subconsciously to the wounded inner child in those with codependency familiar but to the adult perhaps not known at all so but but it is the inner child guiding an adult subconsciously to somebody that is so like a mother or father was even if they didn't have bpd or npd or they might well have had one or the other, one parent or the other, or like in my case, both parents were narcissists, comorbid with my mother with BPD, my father was a dark triad. So, you know, um, but the thing is, it's not just the person with BPD that is the reason that the bond is a trauma bond. And it's important for people with codependency to realize that because I'm not saying the lion's share of it is yours. But you need to take your own personal responsibility to realize you weren't hoodwinked, you weren't seduced, you weren't induced, you weren't persuaded, you weren't forced into it against your own will. There was, there was the aspect of what happened in the beginning of idealization being mirrored and the person with BPD's codependency of people pleasing you that with the hypersexuality, etc., often, not always, but often as a part of the way these relationships started. It's what I call the borderline siren song. It's just too darn good to be true. But man, when it feels that good, who's going to walk away or listen to their gut instinct? Not, not a lot of people, especially because people with codependency, due to what's happened in childhood, something, but it may not be as traumatic as, well, like trauma might sound huge, but there's, there's always something there. Like in 30 years worth of experience, of working with clients, that's the case. And I must say too, sometimes it takes a little while to uncover it, sometimes not. The other thing is, I do want to say this very adamantly here, that not all people, however, that get into a relationship with somebody with BPD are codependent. And I know that that's something that, I don't know how many people talk about it in a really black and white way, but some do. Oh, if you're with a born on, you have to be a codependent. Well, sure, like 95, 97% of people, that's probably true. But there, there is a small percentage, and maybe it's 1% of people, but that still represents a lot of people. I've worked with many clients over the last 30 years in their healing and recovery from a relationship with somebody with BPD or NPD. They are simply not codependents. They just aren't. So not everybody is, but the majority are. Well, yeah, if you get a clueless therapist, uh, that's the first sign you need to get out of there and look for another one. Um, could a codependent or BPD person switch from hoovering to not hoovering? I uh, don't know that codependents hoover, do they? I guess reverse hoover. Um, yeah, they can either be doing it and then they can stop doing it. That's a very individual thing. 
Could it be that with the therapy, they are progressing emotionally and getting to separation individuation? Could the switch be a fair measure of progress? No, no, because again, that's, that's hard to measure. And when people are getting into and through separation individuation with BPD in therapy, a lot of people quit before they get there. A lot of people quit at the beginning of that process. And sadly and tragically, I know in the work I've done with people with BPD, and I still do work with clients with BPD, is whatever I say in a video doesn't mean I'm entirely, I'm not against people with BPD. I'm just telling the facts. And yeah, more for the other side. But um, I've had at least over the last 30 years, five clients who have committed suicide right at the point where they were just, we were doing the work of separation and individuation. They were just getting into it, starting to move through it. In the case of one person, I will never forget. God rest his soul. He was almost through it. And, and, but I guess couldn't tolerate in the end, unfortunately, getting past, couldn't see his way forward to getting past like that growth, which, which in separation individuation for people with BP in therapy, it, it is a letting go of an enmeshed, entangled, perhaps trauma bond even with a parent. So it's a letting go of a parent that somebody might've been enmeshed with for a whole long time. And so this client I'm referring to was years ago. And, you know, when he missed the next session, I was like, I hope nothing's gone terribly wrong. You know, people can miss sessions. And and then about a week later, I got an email from his brother, and they lived in an eastern country. I can't remember which one, but I wouldn't say anyway, uh, that he jumped off a building. And I wasn't, ex I wasn't expecting. Sometimes you can, you know, sometimes people just quit. Sometimes they might, but, but you can usually get some kind of vibe or sense of, you know, wow, somebody's not safe here. He didn't show any of that, and then he was gone. So separa separation individuation isn't like a two-day process in therapy. It's not a week. It's not a month. It's long. It's deep. It brings up the anxiety of the death instinct, which occurred prior to and during the ar emotional arrested emotional, sorry, the arrested emotional development. I know that I've been through that. I know that I don't remember those minutes or those moments when that happened, but it is the death of the otherwise burgeoning psychological death of the person that you were. You know, when you, when you were born, you were an infant, that person that you were psychologically dies when this emotional arrested development happens, which brings about the anxiety of the death instinct. And so there's so much about this process of separation individuation for those in, in, in that work, in that therapy toward recovery with BPD, that you have to learn. And nobody taught me this when I was in therapy. I don't know how I went through it, but I did not understand it then. That it was the anxiety of the death instinct and repetition compulsions and triggered dissociated feelings that I'd already survived. But the point is, it's not a short process. So it's not going to change the behavior of somebody in therapy from hoovering to stop hoovering automatically all of a sudden. No, because it's a much longer process than that. So, so when they stop hoovering, there's, there's no way to measure, but I would say it's not about, it might be that they, well, no, even if they just got into therapy, it's not even that. So no, it's not a, it's not a measure of progress if they stop hoovering. It's just not because they're that changeable. Um, hey, Deb says, hello, AJ. I'm nervous as hell. God brought me here. I'm so glad to be here. Well, I'm sorry you're nervous. Try to relax. Um, my people, I pray this may be inappropriate, but I sent you an email a few days ago asking, and here you are live. Oh, I'm sorry, because I'm always a little behind in emails in general from the website, but I do try to catch up. You said, I'm hardcore. I am a hardcore borderline. Got damaged. I uh, got damaged, three kids. One is already suicided. I'm so sorry to hear that. Um, one lives with me now and is, well, malignant borderline is a misnomer of terms, but you're saying may really have severe BPD. And God help us, my son is um, 
a white police officer, 33 years old. Well, I just want to say first and foremost to you, Deb, I really feel for you. And I'm so sorry for all you've gone through that you, you know and identify yourself as a hardcore borderline, that you were so damaged and traumatized in childhood. And yes, when people don't get into recovery, it often then it's hard to parent kids, you know. So I'm, I'm so sorry for your loss of, of one of your children. And um, yeah, I hope that you're in therapy getting some help. I don't know. And I'm not sure. Um, maybe just resend your email to me to make sure. Because sometimes people say they've sent me an email and I, I it doesn't come through. But usually it comes through. But, but I'm just so sorry because, you know, here's the thing I want people to clearly understand because I talk a lot about BPD for loved ones and non-borderlines, et cetera, because the younger generations really need to hear the video message I gave yesterday. They really, really need to hear it for their own well-being. But I have so much empathy for people with BPD. I really, truly do. How could I have had it and recovered from it and not have that empathy? And the reason I don't make more videos directed to people with BPD is because most people with BPD these days, maybe sometimes to their benefit, but often not so much, are watching a lot of YouTubers with BPD, that they're all very different. Some are more, you know, some still denying that they can recover, but they've come far. Some thinking they're way better than they are, and some whose lives and, and YouTube videos just are... Uh, you bear witness to chaos in them, and, and it's sad. Uh, Wills, no matter how bad anything I go through is, um, Psycho has always had it worse, and I'm, I'm to have such a supportive, quote, parent, quote, in my life. Um, well, you have to become that supportive parent in your life. And there is, you know, and I, I prefer to use, rather than Freudian language, um, uh, Eric Byrne pioneered his own psychodynamic theory of transactional analysis, which is really, really helpful in, in this. And I work with clients with that as well. <laughs> is that, you know, we have three ego states, parent, adult, and child. And so in that parent ego state is where one needs to learn, you know, to tap into, usually working with a therapist. Um, I help clients with this to tap into how to reparent, to be a part of learning how with like, if you want to work with me, my help or who's ever helped, um, to become that nurturing parent to your know, inner parent to the wounded inner child. Um, so that that's for people with codependency and people with BPD to varying degrees. And in your case, wheels, you're going to have to become that part of parent self is going to have to become the nurturing parent to your wounded inner child that you never had. Uh, everyone says you should go no contact with narcs, yes, but he's literally the only, quote, friend I have. Should I still cut him out? Well, yes, you. it would be in your best interest. It might be very difficult, but I would say simultaneously, not only do you need to go no contact from a narcissist, but you also need to seek therapy because you deserve that and you deserve to be able to feel better and you deserve to be on a path to knowing who you are and to be healing the trauma that you didn't ask for in your childhood that's now affecting your life. Uh, Wheels, I always have to hear how um, much better the psycho is than her parents. Uh -huh. <laughs> the other day I got um, dragged into a pity party about how I blame her too much and I need to apologize for what I put her through. Well, yeah, but that's a narcissist for you. I mean, it's always about them. They're always going to be the victim. Even when they're victimizing the living you-know-what out of you, they feel like the victim. It's crazy. Uh, Deb, may I book half a dozen coaching sessions with you, please? I've ordered DBT books from Amazon. Yes, you absolutely can. So please email me again because I don't recall seeing that. Um, and I've been in that email recently. So please email me again. Just go to hmahari.ca slash contact. And I'd be happy to help. I work with people with BPD. It's, my videos might not indicate as if I can, but I'm very empathic and, and very much want to help. And I've helped a lot of people with BPD to recover. And I'm Roller Girl. Hi, AJ. And, um, and all from, oh, Crystal in Las Vegas. Yes, well, hi to you too. And um, so I think it's really important that, you know, 
so many people on YouTube and so many people online in general, and I might look like a hard ass on one side of this equation sometimes, but I'm somebody who gets both sides. And so it's important, and not everybody can get both sides because not everybody had BPD like I did and recovered, right? To get it from the inside out. But the point is that it's so important to not listen to, like, for instance, Sam Backton, because he was mentioned. I just want to say, people at BPD, be very careful, because he says very little often that's really anything you need to hear, or really, I can't say is the guy's all wrong, but it, it, it seems to be that he pulls from older sources more often than not, not always. But, you know, he, he likens BPD to dissociative identity disorder and that type of split and alters. That's just not right. That's just not correct. It's not correct, dare I say. This is not. And so I don't think he's helpful for people with BPD to watch. I mean, you, you know, and then who are you going to watch? Well, I can't, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not even doing videos that are that friendly for you either. I apologize for that. So, but then you got to be careful when you're watching other people with BPD on YouTube too, because some of them are just right, incredible, disorganized, disastrous, self-sabotaging messes. And that's not going to help you learn anything either. Uh, Deb, I searched my whole life for the answer. I'm 62 years old and I know I'm coming to the end of this road. Um, Linda, I take that's her daughter, who suicided four years ago. I believe was very borderline. My heart is shattered. She died. I am so. I feel that. I really do feel with you. I, I I can't feel like what you feel, but I am so so sorry to hear that. And you know, uh, how can I say this? That well, you know, people are going to criticize me. Going to criticize me, but I just want to say, Deb, that I'm the same age as you, and I've been blessed to be recovered for thirty years. And I mean, I really really hope I, I, I want to help you, you know, definitely, because it's such a long road that you've had to hope. And, and not only all that happened to you, but then the loss of your daughter. And you said, oh, God bless you. You're going to love this story because you're a researcher and there's a lot of information in it. Now, I don't research as much. I mean, I research things, but I don't do the original research. But um, the more I learn from clients and people, obviously, the more I can share that information. And I think that this is another call. I'm going to take this as a sign here tonight, Deb and Clover, that I need to do more videos for people with BPD, even if not hardly anybody watches them, because it's probably important. Anyway, um, Grapevine, I'm codependent and trauma bonded to a male diagnosed with BPD, who I, su I suspect is also undiagnosed NPD, if that's possible. Well, yes, it is possible, but... Um, it would be hard to say, right? But yes, some people with BPD, <coughs> excuse me, will have comorbidity. They'll have BPD and NPD. And often those diagnoses might not be made correctly, etc. And But last stats I heard on this for what stats are worth was it could be 37 to 42% of people diagnosed with BPD. But it's not everybody. But yes, that's very possible. And Deb, oh, you're going to love um, my reparenting myself. <laughs> I've been doing it for years, but it got out of hand and almost feels like a split personality now. Well, yes, that will be really interesting to hear about. Absolutely, because hopefully I can help you with that. And I wonder, I wonder, and don't tr don't try to answer me here, but like, yes, I'm very curious to know how it would feel that way. And 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 I hear you. It likely does feel that way. And then you said, I've been on disability for major depression for 25 years. But they had it wrong. Um, they had it all wrong. <clears throat> and they would not accept it was BPD. I was labeled difficult and in a lot of pain and not fixable. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. And I'm just going to, before I read any more comments as they come, just talk a little bit here about... <clears throat> Signs of unhealthy love. And so there's like no big agreed upon list of signs of unhealthy love that are the be all to end all of what is unhealthy love. Okay. But a few things that indicate unhealthy love include much of your time together involves making up after arguments. 
So that means much of your time together is chaotic, conflicting, painful, and argumentative. And or people are being devalued by the personal BPD. Personal BPD may not get that or doesn't uh, you know, acknowledge or can't take responsibility for that. So the majority of your time is dedicated to arguments and conflict and or you know somebody's acting out and or a quiet borderlines the discouraged type you know withdrawing and you getting what you what is the silent treatment on the other side of that though that might not be the intent of it another sign of an unhealthy um, unhealthy love is when you don't have any time for yourself or even when a codependent feels like too insecure about the situation and the relationship on again off again whatever's been going on to take time for themselves because often people with codependency not all people with codependency are the same so you can't say every codependent does one two three four five six seven all these things in a row like but many people with codependency will self-abandon to the point of overgiving which has its own double-edged sword because it's externalized it's overgiving that's inster- externalized from your avoidance of trying to deal with your own issues, you know, in the unconscious, subconsciously. So not having time for yourself. And another sign or indicator of unhealthy love is if you feel possessive about your partner's time, um, or you can't, another sign you can't remember when you last spent time with friends. I have a lot of clients I'm working with now and have in the past that when the relationship ruptures or the person with BPD ghosts them, or they have to end it when it finally ends, uh, and maybe after on and off again and several attempts, etc. They really have to seek the good graces of people they might have known for years or a lifetime as friends to try to go back and reconnect with them. And some people understand and some people don't. This is how isolated a lot of people with codependency will get with a person with BPD, which is what I'm focusing on here, but same is true as if they're with a person with NPD. And another sign of unhealthy love is if you're feeling belittled. And I would think most people, somebody with BPD, have felt belittled. And also if there's a feeling that you have to, like, check their social media uh, to find information out about your partner. Or you have some inherent, this is the codependent I'm speaking of, you have some inherent distrust because things just don't feel right. And then you end up on the social media or I've had clients that have, you know, they're not proud of it, but they've gotten their partner's phones or when, when they're not around or whatever, and they have the password or however they get, or they get through that or they, whatever. And they look and they find out things by looking on phones or social media. So, so even the reason why people would feel they need to do that is an indicator that you're in a toxic relationship and this is not healthy love. And then I'm just thinking, well, so yeah, I'm not going to talk about remedy here, but um, cause it's complex and it's individual and people do ask themselves a million times if they can stay in the relationship, but that's really the work that I do with clients and the exploration. And I just want to say again, too, for people that might resonate with me and be interested in working with me, if you're with somebody with BPD or if you're a person with BPD with a narcissist for kind of love, if you're not sure that you 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 know you don't know how to leave the relationship, you feel addicted, cognitive dissonance, emotional dissonance, etc., but you're not sure what you need to do or not, then you know I'm here to work with you too. Like I don't tell people what to do. I just help people to work their way and process their way through to what decision do they want to make, what decision do they feel is best for them. Because usually when a when a, when a person reaches out to work with me because the relationship isn't over, but they don't know what to do. They kind of already have an inkling what they need to do, but they don't know how to do it. And they don't know how to get to where they need to be, if that makes sense. Yeah, Deb said, uh, so you said that you, yes, back to your other comment. I was labeled difficult and in a lot of pain and not fixable. Therapy started in third grade. The school made him get me therapy because I was so horribly depressed. There just hasn't been the right help. Yeah, it happens to so many people, and it's a tragedy, too. And then you said, okay, I'm going to go resend that email right away. God, I wish I could give you my phone number right now. Well, you can, but I can't just phone you right away. 
a lot of people send me their, their like their stories, their truth, their life, you know, um, and 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 call me with a phone number underneath. But we have to do this in an arranged way, right? And we have to do it in a session kind of ethical way. So um, I never call any of those people back, by the way. It's hard, but um, it's not an ethical or appropriate thing to do. Uh, wheels. Um, I just disengage from everyone as much as possible right now. And especially her, yes, known as Psycho. I've been focusing more on spiritual stuff, recovery, and trying to find a path out of this. I'm looking for any way to protect myself. Well, that's excellent. And you're really working hard on that. And I would say, Wheels, in a way that you already have a part, you know, like part of, at least a part of, this is crazy, is it? Part of your, in, you know, inner parent is your, your parent ego state is actually helping, you know, you and, and the wounded aspect of your inner child already in the work that you're doing and how you're protecting yourself. Deb, I'm so sorry to interrupt, AJ. Oh, you didn't interrupt. That's fine. I think I sent you the email response. The email response to maybe a class of yours. Oh, I see. I'm so afraid of losing touch with you. Oh, okay. Well, um, you know what? I'm going to um, take a screenshot of that, and then I'm going to hang on, wheels. Don't do anything yet, but then we want to delete. i got to get the screenshot first, but please do email me. And, you know, I'm virtually... Well, I shouldn't say it this way, but you can't lose contact with me because under all my videos are my websites and there are three right now that are listed and they all have contact forms. So, you know, just saying, okay, um, well, I can do that. So right now, Deb, I just want you to know you didn't interrupt. You don't have to apologize. And I'm, I'm just going to, I have that, but email me and I'm going to. Take that comment out because I don't like when people put their emails in live streams, okay? It can really get you some unwanted emails. So just know that's the only reason that after I, I got your email, I, I deleted your, just that message. And also, um, please do email me though because, yeah, it's it's just a matter of ethics and, and yes, it's not it's not really appropriate for me to email other people, if you know what I mean. So... People kind of come to me or or not, right? So, but um, I hope that this helps people to think about, you know, people with BPD who are, well, because Clover has mentioned this here, people with BPD who are with narcissists really need to rethink what's happening to them. What, where, where are they at? Because that's, that's not going to work. That's a recipe for disaster and more trauma for people with BPD. And for people with codependency, and if you're just in the stages of dating, you might not be looking at videos yet. But people need to know that this is just not a healthy fit. And then I had a, I've had a couple comments because I'm waiting for more on my video yesterday that will be for from people with BPD saying that what I said is horrible, etc. Um, about how people with BPD can't love, haven't loved you, will not, and cannot love you. And really, it takes substantial therapy. So I can't just say unless until, you know, but I made a generalized statement. People have to be healed and recovered, which is so possible. Unlike the narrative of the pseudoscience. And I'm now going to point out American psychiatry. I'm going to be specific, which, yes, it's invaded and predominant in Canada. But it's North American centric psychiatry, which the rest of the world is doing better than the U.S. brand of the hegemony of big pharma and psychiatry. And that's pretty much invaded Canada. But the rest of the world is doing better. And the ICD-11 being published, and some of it being published, but more being put when it's fully published. And I have other ICDs, so I'm not new to the ICD. It is a better manual to follow than the DSM any day and all day long. Uh, Deb, you're awesome. I wouldn't expect anything different. And yes, I resonate with almost everything you say. Well, thank you for that. But I just really hope I, you know, I want to help you as much as I can. And wheels, I'm looking at legal stuff and everything. I'm determined to survive all this. Good for you. I'm, that's fantastic. And I just so support you and what you're doing. That's, that's yes. Everything that you need to do is can't leave any stone unturned to, to get to the goal that you need, which is to get out of there and be somewhere safe and be able to continue to heal. And you'll be able to heal even more when you can get into no contact. And so it's really important for people with codependency to realize, like, oh, I was going to say there was another comment on the channel 
recently about uh, that I was confusing people with BPD or something. Uh, somebody who's older and has worked through a lot, they said, which I believe, and they're now 60 years old. And so they thought I was talking about, by the way, there is no such thing as malignant borderline personality disorder, okay? There's a YouTuber out there that coined it for God knows what reason. But if you look into that, unless people started to copy her with the term, uh, it just leads back to her. So that's maybe good clickbait for her, you know? But there's no such thing. There's no diagnosis known as malignant borderline at all. So um, there's, there's, I like to, I need, uh -huh, I want to be really careful in language. I don't like the word spectrum. A slippery slope. But so as this person said, they were a certain way in their 20s. And I, I hope they might respond to my comment because I said, but they didn't describe how they were in their 20s. That would be interesting to know, you know, as to what I said in that video. Did it apply to them in their 20s and in their 30s? And then they said they had a major um, crash, I guess, like psychologically, when they were 40. And they spent most of their, I don't know from like in the 40s, but they said in their 50s, um, you know, and I take it in therapy and recovery and growing and changing. Well, and that can happen. And then they said, because they are sure they can love. Well, so my message in the last video, hard hitting and sort of a universalistic message, anything that's universally applied is not going to apply to everybody. So there are people who've gone through recovery from BPD and or are recovered or very close that, yes, now they know how to love. But those aren't likely to be the people that are younger. Those aren't likely to be the people that millennials and the next generation down or half of Gen X are going to find. And I can't tell you how many clients I've worked with and some I'm working with now that are in their 50s and 60s and have been married for 25, 30, 40 years and all kinds of stuff has gone on in those marriages because they've been married to a, a person with BPD all those years. And the relationships don't last if people don't get into therapy, if people don't get into healing and recovery change. And there's so many obstacles to it. There truly is. Not only whatever people with BPD might think, feel, or deny, some people with that, but even people really looking for help. It's really hard to find it often in many places. And for many various different reasons, but I think in the U.S. now it's almost reached 50% of clinicians that won't work with people with BP. I don't know what it's like in Canada here, but I'd say it's probably a good 30 to 40%. And also then there are people specialized in BPD, yes, and hey, I'm sure they're great, and then there are leading experts in it, and some of them, well, they're in deep into the pseudoscience narrative of, you know, psychiatry and the hegemony of big pharma, which is a problem. It really is a problem. Look around the rest of the world and read some of those studies, which I've been reading many more lately as I have time, from psychiatrists from anywhere but North America. And I hate to say that of Canadian psychiatrists, but a lot of them have just parroted the U.S. Like I said, thanks a lot, Dr. Joel Paris. Not sarcasm and, and then some. Tried to get that guy's attention to interview him some years ago. Funny, Dr. Nal McLaren granted me two interviews. Dr. John Breeding, a psychologist in Texas, I think one or two interviews. Dr. Daniel Edmonds, out of the blue, an interview. Dr. Joel Paris would not give me the time of freaking day. Gee, I wonder why not, huh? I mean, it's obvious why not, in my opinion. Anyway, because he's, he's in Canada, based in Canada, but he's been interfacing with U.S. psychiatry so much, it's like, he, he he is one of the major players in bringing that brand of, quote, pseudoscience of psychiatry, unquote, to Canada. There are others. Um, and, of course, I'm not saying all psychiatrists are horrible people or bad people, but they are inculcated into believing the prescription pad is the way to go with people with BPD, even though, and I'm going to say this one more time, Anybody who's worth their salt and knows anything about this, especially in a professional capacity, quote, psychiatric medication is contraindicated in the treatment of borderline personality, unquote, period, end of story. And I think that the pseudoscience of American 
transported into Canada, North American centric psychiatry with hegemony with big pharma, North American centric again, I'd like to say largely is also, you know, they, they try to talk out of it. My last count, it's like as if they have eight sides of a mouth and none of it matches up and they don't, unlike this recent study, one I've read, one I'm still looking for, and I haven't had time, and I've been reading other things by some of these people that I found all their names now, and I know where to look. Um, and there are psychiatrists from anywhere but North America, okay, all kinds of different countries, what they're doing. That's making progress. And there's this, there's one or two studies that have actually, guess what they did? What a scientific method of study and inquiry would be, what, what it requires that American, North American-centric psychiatry does not do. They replicated the studies. That's huge. So what we think in North America, specifically in the U.S., about BPD, uh, that it's this big personality disorder. It's a serious mental illness. Poppycock it is. It's a trauma response. And and you gotta, and people got to you know, think about that human context. And these newer and other areas of the world studies and the publication of the ICD-11 is going to be the precursor to blowing American um, psychiatry's narrative of BPD out of the friggin' water. So people with codependency need to know they have responsibility to not for getting abused by somebody with BPD, but for trying to rescue them, for overgiving, for loving and maybe giving too much empathy. Um, compassion is always a positive thing. But you can't sacrifice yourself for someone else, especially, you can't, and you shouldn't anyway, but when you can't even help that person, because people with BPD can be helped, but it needs to be in therapy. And the other thing I was just going to say is, so, and then the other thing in the U.S., you know, there, there are pioneering clinicians in this area, yeah, but like I said, most of them in the pseudoscience narrative of American psychiatry. And then there are all these treatment centers that have popped up. Well, I don't know what they do or not, but I know that they're out of the reach of most people because they cost thirty to fifty thousand dollars plus a month. And I have had clients who have sent a few clients, so not like tons and tons, maybe ten families or clients, parents that have sent an adult child to one of these treatment centers, mortgaging houses like way over their heads to afford, and their adult child did not come back changed or very much changed and so I'm not you know I'm not mentioning any treatment centers names I don't know what they do but perhaps some of them get good results but who's got fifty thousand dollars a month not well maybe lots but not many people and Deb said no doubt about that paid but she's my kid and I'm hoping um can maybe be able to light the path that will lead out of this horrid generational mess yes and by the way, the way it becomes a generational mess, by and large, is not genetics, unfortunately. And I you know, want to be really respectful to you, Deb. But it's when people are so wounded that, you see, th this is another testament. Oh, God, Deb, I want to be so sensitive to you. You did your best. I'm sure you did your damnedest as a mother. But the thing is, you were already encumbered and impeded by the very trauma that you sustained. And, and and so it's not so much genetics, you know, but I just, I don't want to say more because I want to be very sensitive to you. And, and I want, I don't want you to hear blame in what I'm saying because you did the best you could. And you said, I'll find a way, um, I'll find, I'll, I'll find my way to you. Okay. Thank you for everything that you do. Um, my heart asks God that he will touch and comfort every single soul here. Well, yeah, and, and I really pray that God will comfort you, Deb, and and open up the possibility for you that, you know, if we work together, that we can, that, that things will move with God's help between both of us to get you where you need to go and where you need to be and what you need to learn and et cetera. So, um, so toxic relationships, people need to realize it's not on one person's fault. It's maybe not equal, but you know, I, I just think it's really important to 
whoever you watch, wherever you get your information, really, if people don't have empathy, and you know, one thing I would never say to anybody with BPD, just because I had BPD recovered, or I've had codependency as well, and I'm pretty recovered from that, but codependency is something that I don't think we have to watch out for it all day long, all the time, <clears throat> as you don't when you recover from BPD either. So there's all this misinformation out there. But I would definitely not want to say to you, so because I did this, and because right now, like I'm in a great relationship right now, I've had healthier ones before, even with a few in between that weren't as healthy. Um, I wouldn't want to say, put it down to a simple question of like, are you happy? So obviously people in these relationships are not happy, but they're not, they're not leading with the idea of being happy. That's one of the problems with the question, are you happy? And in general, I would not say, so you listening to me right now, or if you watch a lot of my videos, as many people become clients of mine do, I'm not here to say, because I did this and because I did that, because I recovered from this and I recovered from that, you know, like codependency largely, and BPD, you know, and, and that is a complete recovery. It really is, because then we learn how to be, in that recovery from BPD, we, we become averagely human in, in every which way, like, like everyone else. So we don't keep going back to symptomology or triggers because we heal them. So I would never want to say to somebody, simply, are you happy? Because obviously people come into my streams watching my channel probably aren't happy. And lots of people are so addicted to the relationship. And people with codependency, it's so compelling that... They don't even stop to think if they're happy or not. How do they measure happiness? Because maybe they're not quite so sure what happiness is any more than they are what healthy love is and isn't. And so I wouldn't say because I did this or I did that or this is the way that I did this or that, that that's how you have to do it. When I work with clients, it's not like that. It's your process and I help you and I can educate you and I, I can give you homework and I can guide you and I can hear you and I can respond and I can give you feedback, but I'm, you're not going to be doing it the way I did it because you're you. So watch out for messages that suggest it's all about the person with the message in that regard and watch out for people that deliver their message without empathy because there are so many out there just in general. And I'm not picking on Backman when I say that because we all know he doesn't have any empathy. At least he announced that, didn't he? More or less. Um, wheels, I'm starting to feel a little proud of surviving. That's great. All I have so far. It can be hard not to be bitter and angry, but I'm going to keep moving forward. Well, yeah, and I mean, there, there's a stage. Bitter is one thing, you know, people should really try to not fall into or get engulfed by or, you know, stick with or get stuck in. But Anger is a very healthy stage of all this, right? And and anger is a healthy emotion. It's what we do with anger that might not be so healthy versus healthy. And so having anger wheels, don't ever think that when you're angry, there's something wrong with that because it actually your anger is motivating you into this healing, re, you know, um, not react, sorry, healing action that you are undertaking. And so keep moving forward, but Yes, try to avoid the bitter, but don't let go of the anger too soon because it's really got you in action and it's about protecting yourself. So in that regard, your anger your anger is not only justified, it's really healthy in how it's moving you forward. Hey there, Joe Friendly, how are you? Rob, AJ, I think you mentioned that codependents are trapped um, in the... Uh, maybe you mean the toxic relationship. I don't know. If only I did, oh, trapped in the, oh, if only I did this or that differently with the partner, I find that I'm really playing dialogues in my head where I'm telling, uh, you're telling yourself that, or you're telling, oh, you're telling that person off. Well, and I mean, it sounds like, again, some healthy anger, but maybe where you're channeling it, directing it isn't as healthy as it could be for yourself. Because Yes, after, and especially if one's ghosted or if one leaves the relationship, but after the relationships, for people with codependency, after these toxic relationships, there's going to be the what ifs because 
you know, people with codependency, self-esteem is low. It's going to be lower after a toxic relationship than maybe it was in the first place, or maybe even a bit obliterated. It needs to be built back and found again, and self-worth and self-esteem. And the point of that is that's what also drives along with cognitive dissonance, confusion, maybe having some Stockholm syndrome, feeling like, like having been addicted, trying to, you know, going through what is really a literal psychological withdrawal from these people. Um, the if only, all the thought distortions, if only, woulda, coulda, shoulda, you know, and, and that can be a huge trap. Sometimes why people don't get out of the relationships, but after even the relationship ends, whichever way it ends, then that is like what I would call a mind trap that people have to really address. And again, some people get through this on their own and that's great, but it's, it's, I really think not always with me, obviously not everybody resonates with me, but people need to work with someone who really knows this inside out, right? Who's an expert, not only in BPD, NPD, cluster B, etc., but in codependency as well. And that interplay, the dynamic, the trauma bonding, the toxic relating between both, not to say it's equal, but yes, it's really important when you have a dialogue going on in your head to 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 look at maybe with somebody the deeper roots of that because it's it it's not likely to all be just coming from the BPDX like or that relationship that experience it often goes back to something in childhood that might be similar not the same and so these can be negative core beliefs that are entrenched with injunctions and family rules and this is why I talk about doing family of origin work with people in codependency, recovery, and healing, and self-differentiation. So for people with BPD, it's first separation individuation and binding self, and then later it could be some self-differentiation. But self-differentiation for codependency, people with codependency and healing and recovery and looking at the relationship and healing from that is going back to understand the woundedness of your childhood, whatever that was, to whatever degree that was so that you can see where the negative core beliefs, maybe some are, you know, um, taken on board from a cluster B relationship, but where they either the dots connect or they overlap because for most people, the very nature of the woundedness from these toxic relationships for people with codependency largely comes from, largely comes from the toxic relationship too. But, but also there's something underlying that from childhood. And the reason that, I'll just speak for myself, but in my work with, with clients for 30 years, and I continue to educate myself, and I read all the latest books, and I stay up on the latest information, and some journal articles that I think have any meaning, because the ones in American psychiatry often with, you know, it's ideology only. They often don't have a lot of meaning or, you know, application. But staying up on the latest in many different disciplines, and I'm going to start blogging about a lot of this to a point um, at AJMaharicoaching.com or linked here from YouTube is AJMaharibblog.com on the thumbnails just for something shorter. Um, so I don't have much up there yet, but I hope to get more up there soon. And then I'm going to have also courses and information products coming that won't cost an arm and a leg uh, that will help people with this too. So it's really important to realize that as much as people are really hurting these toxic relationships with somebody with BP or NPD, there's something that the root of codependency is in childhood. And so it was already there. And it is often the reason that people get into these relationships, but that's on a subconscious level. So really important for people to think about that and to know that recovery it's not a one, two, or three, or four, or five step process. It is multifaceted. It involves a lot of steps and a lot of different parts to the process. And the other thing, too, is whether or not you go to Codependence Anonymous, that's not a recovery vehicle from these relationships or really codependency. Could it be helpful to somebody? Maybe. I went to Codependence Anonymous years ago, and I would just say the group was too dysfunctional because they couldn't even adhere to the way the group was supposed to run but also i should tr remember to link under i'll try to remember to link under this live stream so as a lot of people are talking about this 
newer to YouTube, etc., which is fine. I just want to say, going back to, I've been online since 1995, I have a website that I created in 1995. It's called soulsouthhelp.on.ca. Pretty static now, pretty left alone. But on there, I happen to have a page, so I'll link it. It's soul, S-O-U-L, self, help, all one word, dot O-N dot C-A slash CODA. And it's where the 12 steps from Codependence Anonymous are and more information about that. But that is something that may add extra support for people, but it is not. Because the modality of the 12 step can be helpful somewhat, but is outdated to what we actually understand codependency to really mean and what the root of codependency really is. And it's not something well-defined universally either, because the more clients I work with, with codependency and or because they've been in a cluster B relationship, toxic relationship, the more I realize that People's codependency and the roots of the codependency in childhood are so variable as, as so many people are individual with this. So don't let, let anybody put you in a box called all the code, all codependents this, all codependents that. Because it's not the same for all people with BPD. All be, there's no monolithic group of any quote collection of, you know, or such label or named group of people out there. Very individual. Uh, M, hey, AJ, do you think it's a healthy thing to be replaying what-ifs to some extent, that this would indicate that some kind of attachment was formed, which seems to be healthy or no? Well, no, I don't really think, I don't really know if it would indicate that an attachment was formed because it sort of, to, in, to me, indicates more that a trauma bond was formed. Um, that if, if somebody is what ifing about something or replaying out things, um, that that still for most people would be considered, it would be obsessive, it's an obsession, or in Freudian terms, it's a fixation. It's not healthy for people. It's full of thought distortions, and it's going to be thought distortions superimposed on inaccurate understanding of information as to what actually happened in this relationship because you have your emotional lens and then you want to logically be able to you know get totally unconfused and get clarity as to what really happened and so what if thing and if only and replaying it in your head is really just going to block you from moving forward you know and um so i don't think it really indicates that an attachment is formed at all it's it's obsessive it it it's more about a trauma bond than attachment, and um, so I I think it's something that happens for people, but I don't think it's the healthiest thing for people to stay engaged with, and that's why I recommend that people get treatment. Uh, Joe Friendly, I'm my unfortunate in my unfortunate personal experience. Once I pegged what was wrong with me, dependency issues, obviously. I was able to see my BPD possible NPD relationship for what it is. I also was easily able to understand my historical problem of attracting toxic women. Well, that's really good because a lot of people, even with that lens and a different perspective, can still take a lot longer to understand all that. But if that became more clear to you, that's fantastic. I mean, at that point. And, um, AJ, you mentioned previously having BPD and codependence. Did you experience both simultaneously? Well, yes, but they're not called co-occurring because codependency isn't, <laughs> thank God, um, because the DSM from America is crazy. Um, uh, they're not co-occurring, quote, disorders because codependency is not a personality disorder. Codependency is not even an established diagnosis of any sort. Not that that makes anything real on, on its, you know, on j just prima facie or anything. It doesn't. But, um, yes, I was codependent. If, you know, I was, oh, God, probably since I was, like, three or something, whenever you can develop it. But people with BPD who are also codependents, the two, they, they are both at the same time simultaneously. But, but they're not co-occurring, quote, disorders, unquote. Um, cause it's just not the way that code, and then, so people with BPD have codependency, 
which would be less likely to be very apparent in a comorbid BPD NPD or in somebody more severely impacted by BPD even. And all these things are not measurable, right? So I'm making big statements here that I hope puts across some meaning. So no, I didn't have them at separate times. I think what's more true to say about I had it, they're simultaneous, but they're not co-occurring, if that makes any sense. Because they're both, BPD is a trauma response, and so is codependency. Though codependency trauma might be a lot less than BPD trauma. In 75% of cases of those with BPD. So the thing about that is, they don't happen separately for people with BPD. And for people with codependency, not all people with codependency have BPD. So those are important distinctions to make. And um, and I was, you know, doing quite well in my life. I worked through a lot of codependency recovery. And then I would say I've had more struggles with codependency on this friggin' YouTube channel. Um, specifically in the last two years or so. I think kind of culminating and ending... Um, how long ago was it? Uh, at least three or four months ago. But that was not reflective of my life, of the way I relate to people in my life. Or like I have, I, you know, I, keep, I can't keep saying new partner, but it's been three months now. I'm in a fantastic relationship. And it, I don't have codependency in my relationship. And then more to the point too, like I did a video, I don't know, sometime last week or when I can't keep track of when they go up. Where and I, it's like, I don't know, codependency and something, something, and just my name up there with my thoughts on it. It's, uh, it's 27 minutes long. I don't know what it's called. Or maybe I'm not referring to the right, I mean, there's that one. But yeah, well, whatever one I talk about, my ex, quiet BP partner, who took her life December 27, 2018, because I was trying to break up with her. Um, the point is, though, I realize I've learned a lot in retrospect and in being able to think about that without falling totally into complex, complicated grief, um, but I still am grieving because it's just the nature of complex, complicated grief. But what I said in that video, which is maybe two or three videos ago now, I don't know, um, is that I, I was not responding to my ex with quiet BPD. I wasn't responding to her in a codependent fashion at all. Like, this is part of why I never figured out she had quiet BPD. We didn't live together. So I'm just talking to you about how I recovered. I've done so much recovery from codependency now. And yes, a lot of that, some of it happened when I was in recovery from BPD. I fully recovered from BPD. But then after I fully recovered from BPD and I met the person that was the first love of my life, even though I had a 13 year relationship when I had BPD, because, hey, I was, you know, I knew who I was. I was now more at that point, more capable of love after healing and recovery. And I met the person that was my first love. And so at that point, when that person broke up with me, I broke up with her first, not to this ego thing, but I did try to break up with her first. And then she kind of manipulated me out of that. I felt like it was manipulation in retrospect. But then she broke up with me about a month later. So whether that was just her control game, I don't know. She wasn't a borderline or anything. She had a few other issues. She had bipolar, by the way. So I don't know. Do they have control issues too? I don't know. So anyway, then when she broke up with me, and this was the first love of my life, and the only time I've been broken up with, which is just weird. I'm not saying that because I think I'm special or anything. Um, when I went home after that, because I was in the States and et cetera, when I came back and I uh, I was like, and I sat in my apartment and after, you know, she left and everything, I was like in agony. And, um, and then I just realized like a Mack truck driving a thousand miles an hour, I hit a wall with codependency written all over it, but the codependency was always there. I just got more aware of it at that point in time, which was like 1997, eight, nine in there. So, so that's when I started working really feverishly, even more so on codependency recovery. And then it, so, so it's been much better in my life. Yet it translated onto YouTube. I found myself being extremely, ridiculously codependent at times. And I figured out what the reasons for that were. And then the crappy, fawning responses that I had that I knew I was having in moments and times. And so, yeah. Anyway, um, with the quiet ex, the quiet BPD ex of mine, when she was always changing plans, always canceling plans, 
sometimes, you know, we get along and then like we, when we got close, typical uh, people with BPD and quad BP is then, you know, closeness we would accomplish once in a while, but that intimacy would, you know, emotional intimacy, et cetera, would send her to fear of engulfment. And I didn't realize this, but off she'd go and withdraw. And I wouldn't hear from her sometimes for days, a week. I think the longest a few times was a couple of months. But I wasn't responding in any caretaking way or overgiving way or pursuing way or codependent way. I just went on with my business. And it was actually when I thought about that some more as I did that video and I was just, it was just coming out of me. It's the truth. I was like, wow, yeah, that's what it was. In large part, why I didn't realize she was quite BPD is because I wasn't in a codependent role with her. And I just went on with my life and I'm like, okay. And at times I thought, well, this is weird. Or, you know, but I never took it the next step because I wasn't trying to change anything about it. And then at one point I was ready to, to break up and, well, she didn't get through that. So, but they're not co-occurring disorders. It's really important to note. They happen simultaneously, but there's a difference in what those, the different use of language would connotate, okay? Joe Friendly, I've done a lot of what ifing. Um, it was useless. Well, that's a good way to put it. It it was when I concentrated purely on their concrete behavior only that I could see the truth of their actions and words. Excellent. And I'm glad that you found your way to that. And and thank you for sharing that, Joe Friendly, because that could be helpful to so many people who are in that, you know, fixation or obsession of what ifing, because it's a search for closure. Everything really that blocks people from the recovery, you know, for people with codependency is a search for closure. And someone said in a live stream recently, and no disrespect to this person, it's where they're at. They asked some questions that were hard to answer. I couldn't give, you know, like a definite answer because I don't know the person, the situation. And they said, I feel like if I don't figure this out, I can't heal. Well, that that's another mind trap. People create that one for themselves because there's always a way to resolution and getting that on your own. But, and I think, you know, Joe Friendly, the, what you're saying, when you stop the what if thing, you know, it was, it was useless. It was only when you looked at their concrete behavior, what you actually experienced from them, that you could see the truth of their actions and words, which would give, I think, a lot of clarity and help you move forward. Rav, AJ, can you please discuss the difference between an attachment and a trauma bond? I thought it was the same thing. Oh. Well, I can't really say a lot about it here just because of the time, and I'm trying to make sure these streams don't go too long, but I might address that in a video. But what I can say is they're definitely not the same thing because I guess a trauma, like a trauma bond shouldn't really be thought of as, quote, an attachment, unquote, because it's really a, quote, bond, unquote, that lacks attachment for, for you know, that, that's the best way I can put it right now. Because people with BPD cannot attach, have not, will not, and do not love you if they don't know who they are. If they haven't had enough, you know, all the way down the line, even past. A lot of people think they've had significant therapy and they've been on and off maybe for five years or six years or seven years. But if it's only, and they might really be intellectual and have more awareness, but if it's not in their emotional landscape, they're still symptom managing and they're still not able to attach. And a lot of them know they can't have relationships right now. Like they know they still can't handle trying to get close, trying to deal with an engulfing fear and then distancing and then getting, losing themselves in, in the other person and then fear of abandonment, etc. So I think it's really important to, um, oh, I didn't get to read your other message, Joe Friendly, before you took it out. I don't mind that you take them out, but at least if I would have read it, um, it would be on the record. Um, so to what you're saying, Rav, um, attachment. So some, a lot of people with codependency, even if they had relatively secure attachment with a parent, it's it, it's debatable because maybe they didn't quite make it to secure attachment. It's hard to say. But the thing is, attachment for people with codependency with somebody with cluster B is not healthy because people with cluster B can't attach. So how is it the codependent is attaching to someone who's not attaching to them? Well, it's a one-sided nature of all that that means and the self-abandonment and, and just obliterating oneself over the long haul. 
it's it's not really an attachment and that's i guess why it's described best as a trauma bond a traumatic bond and i believe the source i quoted earlier i'm pretty sure that patrick carnes is the author of and i've read the book it's somewhere on one of my shelves the betrayal bond so these are bonds unhealthy tra trauma bonds are basically built on betrayal from the get-go but people with codependency don't know that the people bp don't know that consciously either i don't even know if a narcissist knows that consciously but the betrayal for the person with bp the betrayal is happening to the codependent even in the idealization but it's not done on purpose and it's not you know you're not persuaded you're not seduced you're not induced you're making your own choices but you don't realize what's driving you subconsciously and they don't realize what's driving them subconsciously. That's about as best I can do with it right now. And Clover, why can't borderlines attach? Well, because they don't have a self from which to attach. And of course, there's a lot more deeper explanation that would take me hours to give here. But you have to know who you are. You, because you see, actually people with BPD need to find their true self that, that they lost to arrested emotional development because you first have to attach to yourself before you can attach to anyone else. MC said, yeah, Joe, I guess I didn't see any real crap other than feeling like I had a lot of emotional expectation of me until the complete withdrawal. It felt like there was a lot of, uh, there was lots of vulnerability. Yes. And mutual. Oh, it felt like there was uh, vulnerability and mutual sharing. Oh yes. Can feel that way when it isn't though including talking about traumatic people in toxic relationships. So I was just kind of taken aback that he didn't want to talk about what went wrong. Well, and you know, that's another thing that happens in these relationships, right? Like with, you know, the Jade, right? To justify, argue, defend, and explain. When you try to hold somebody with BPD accountable, it's a little bit different with a narcissist, but you're trying to hold them accountable. You're asking them, what happened here? Why did you just do this? Or you just did that? What, what, what? And then they're going to throw in the red herring, and I've done a couple of videos of this. Uh, no closure in BPD. A uh, more recent one, which is, uh, yeah, I don't know. Check in the last month or so if you haven't seen that one and you'd like to. And then also one I did a while back, which is called Jade, Circular Conversations, or something like that, with or BPD or Borderline Circular Conversations or something like that. And it's got a purple thumbnail. And um, it will... Um, it will help you because, and in the other video where no closure, I talk about how people have gone through that with all these, because it's people who are trying to hold people with BP accountable for how they've just hurt you, or what they've just done in the relationship, that end up justifying, arguing, defending, and explaining themselves against what people think people with BP are gaslighting, but they're really not gaslighting, but they're, they're defending themselves and they throw in red herrings and they change the subject and Next thing you know, whatever you were concerned with, and I and I demonstrate this, I go through this in a video from about three weeks or a month ago. So so there's often conversations about a lot of things, whether they're in general or you're trying and you get into these jade circular conversations with people, BP, wherein they defend and confuse you. They just wear you out. It can go on for hours. But it can at the time feel like there's mutuality, but there really isn't. And, and vulnerability, they can sometimes seem vulnerable, or they could fleetingly have a moment of vulnerability, but that's usually followed up by strong defense. It's going to be rather off-putting or distancing. Uh, Lisa, thank you for your extraordinary explanation of your experience. Oh, you're welcome. Um, I am able to grasp it. Not sure I could explain or repeat it approximately. Laugh out loud. Well, you know, I went through it, so it's pretty clear to me. <laughs> um... MC, wow, a search for closure. Yes. Well, because that's what it is. On all the what ifing and all the going over things, some of that is going to happen for people, right? I mean, because it takes time to process everything. But they're all iterations of trying to make sense out of something that doesn't make sense. They're all iterations of trying to find closure. And the best way to find closure is to go no contact and then be working in your own healing recovery process and you will find that closure. And Joe Friendly said, my experience with many BPD relationships is exactly as you were describing it. All of these women seem incapable of actually loving me. It's very true. And uh, Joe Friendly also said, it was just endless control battles. 
it's disturbing how similar they all are. Well, they have that similar, you know, um, woundedness from trauma that they need to take responsibility for. And Joe Prenley also said to MC, they didn't, they did that, quote, expectation, unquote, thing with me too, all of them. Funny though, they never seem to have many um, expectations for themselves. That's a good point. And then you also said, Joe Prenley, I would agree with you, AJ, on how you find closure. Well, and I'm glad that you know that, Joe Friendly, because that speaks well of your journey. And you're doing quite well for yourself, and that's important. And that's when many more people are just on the beginning or not quite yet on the beginning of that journey. And um, Clover said, uh, so the narcissist I'm dealing with, this is crazy, but I feel like I have to sit on the sidelines just in case I'm the only person left on earth who will be with him. Don't know why I feel that. Hmm. Um, maybe because they really don't know who you are. Maybe because that means you don't have self-esteem, self-worth, and self-respect. And you do, you do, I'm not saying it's crazy, but you preface it by saying this is crazy. So all I'm saying is, listen to your own words, not, not calling you crazy, but just saying, you know it's not healthy, right? And you said you feel like you have to sit on the sidelines just in case you're the only person left on earth who will be with him. But see, that's never going to happen because whatever's going to happen in this world or whatever, there isn't going to be like one or just two people left, so to speak. And the other thing is, while there's other people on the earth, they continue to go forward and find supply, supply, target more and more people. And if he was ever to come back to you, it would only be because he couldn't find ripe enough supply and he would only come back to reuse you as old supply that he's already found not adequate now that doesn't mean you're not adequate but like as supply for the narc no you're not it anymore so it, even if he would return it would be only to use you very briefly until he could jump to the next supply that's how they operate um wheels i think the, and, and i think you just need to um if you can you know Get into therapy, get some support, and just let that go. Because it sounds like he's already let you go, and you're hoping he'll come back. But for what? For more of the same and to leave you again? Um, uh, you know, that's not you being kind to you. Wheels, I think the hardest thing for me is a combination of grief and survivor guilt. It's a real pain. I deal with it daily. I think you're right about the anger being helpful because it overrides the guilt enough for me to keep going. I think I'm here for a reason and I want to live the life others tried to take. Yes, well said and very good very good on your part. Excellent that you're so determined and I'm just like so rooting for you and you always have my support. You're doing a great job. And um, yeah, well the survivor guilt, you know, that I understand that it can happen in many different ways and iterations for people but I hope you can keep working through that because the grief will be ongoing for a longer period of time but you have nothing to feel guilty for for surviving no matter what the psycho says uh, MC thanks AJ you talked about red herrings but that never really happened so much as changing the subject well yes if you don't get a red herring you'll get a subject change and or you could get both and then moving to immediately end the relationship, I think he was a quiet borderline. And then MC asked Joe, did the expectations thing make you uneasy? MC, for me, I felt like I was just going to let him down when he realized I wasn't perfect. Well, and that's what comes with the territory of idealization, being put on the pedestal, right? The second anybody, especially with BPD, I guess mainly, but I guess a person with codependency could sort of idealize somebody. But the thing is, whenever you're put on a pedestal, as sure enough that they put you there, they're going to tear you the hell off of there. Uh, whether it's quickly or in due time, it's, it's like being put on a pedestal and idealized to begin with is only the precursor to the opposite. And people don't know that when they first get involved in these relationships. And, and really, in a way, you know, for people with people with BPD, you know, often with codependency, you feel like you're going to let them down when you're not perfect because you can never be enough. And that's not your fault. It's because they see you 
as object other, in this case, he would have seen you, MC, as object other mother representation, whether it was a bad mother in splitting, good mother in idealization, or a variance of, of, of like not good mother in idealization, but good mother never had. So the point is you can't um, live up to his, his fantasy of good mother never had, you know, or, or turn into the mother that he never had, which is where people with BPD are emotionally, and they don't realize that often until unless they get into enough treatment to start understanding what that's all about. I remember when I learned that in therapy, it blew my mind. And yet I had an awareness prior to learning that when I was probably in my early 20s. I knew. I didn't know what it meant, but I knew that I was kind of relating to everybody as if they were my mother or father, but I didn't know what it meant. And I, I didn't know how to stop it yet. I would learn that in therapy. Not too many, maybe a few years, four or five years after I had that first realization. Um, Joe Friendly to MC, it always made me uneasy. It was often oddly stated over the top in the context of the conversation. It was like they were auditioning a servant. Oh, that's a really good way to put it. Well, and the false promises and the codependent, you know, um, people pleasing in that as well on the part of people with BPD. It's all of that and then some. MC, yeah, just as quickly and un unfoundingly as I was put up there, I was taken down. Yes, that's exactly how it goes. And see, it really doesn't have anything to do with you because you got put up there. And let's face it, none of us are all that, right? What, what people aggrandize us to be in idealization. No, we're not that. But we're also not what they devalue us to be either. And uh, Joe Cranley said, again, no mention of what expectations I might have for them. Yes, it's very, it's all very one-sided because they don't really see you, right? It's all about, that's the part of the self-absorption in BPD, which it doesn't make them narcissists, but it's overlappingly similar in a way, but maybe to varying degrees. But they don't think about you. They don't think about other. They don't think about what did you just experience or it's all about what did they just experience. And then usually they project it out that what they experienced was what you experienced because they just did it. But again, as far as expectations, like they, sometimes you even ask a lot of people at BPD, like, what do you want for dinner? And they don't know. They're like, I'll have what you're having. Or what restaurant do you want? I don't know. What restaurant do you want to go to? What movie do you want to watch? I don't know. What movie do you want to watch? And then, of course, you might go through 10 of them because they go, I hate this movie. But they don't know what movie they like. So it's, yeah. And then because they're so defensive. And they're often fighting a lot of, like, triggered emotional distress. Like, this is just the inside explanation. When they're going through all the stuff they're going through inside, whether they show it outwardly or not, they are totally self-absorbed by that. They, they are busy. They are exhausted. They are, they, and that's not an excuse, right? Because they need to go to therapy and work their way through that because it's never okay or healthy to be, quote, in a, well, to be in a toxic relationship with somebody that you think is a relationship that's going to work and never consider their expectations or their needs or their wants or them or, you know, intimacy needs, uh, emotional and otherwise, which can definitely be there in idealization and evaporate later. Uh, MC, he actually said I reminded him of the family that helped save his life. Alan Ergold might be, you know, some conflation of something, who knows? Uh, maybe it was an actual memory. But he's associating the two, and then, of course, that might be the reason you end up on a pedestal. But guess what? Respectfully, that had nothing to do with you, right? So, so that, and that's the good news, because you weren't the greatest, whatever he thought, because of somebody else, and you weren't everything he said in devaluation either. He didn't know who you were. That's, that's the real aspect of these relationships for people who are the non-borderlines, is that when they're over, these people... They, they, they didn't attach to you. They didn't love you. They can't love you. They will not love you. They didn't invest in you. They don't know much about you because it was all about them and their needs and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And MC said, that's really interesting, Joe. I guess I felt like the audition never happened and I got the job I didn't deserve. Wow. Yeah, that's that's insightful, um, the way you're both putting that. And Joe Friendly said, we were, are in love with illusions. Illusions created by people who are incapable of loving us back. 
people who will eventually replace us and tell us it's tell us it's our fault when they do. Very well said. Very well said. And that speaks to, you know, how they're not really Oh, you're welcome, MC. How they're not really the person that people think they are in the beginning, but they're not because they don't know who they are. So they don't love, they haven't loved, they can't love, and they will not love, and they don't attach either. And people like Joe Friendly and MC come to realize this and many others in their own time, and it's individual for everybody. But when you get the clarity of what really went on and you get past the agony and the wedding and the fixations on everything, over time, people come to realize what MC and Joe Friendly are so wisely um, sharing here out of their own experiences and, and Joe Friendly's clarity with that now. And I think so many people, uh, hopefully, if they'll come by and catch this live stream later, will, will benefit so much from what you two have shared as well and others. And um, it's, it's mind boggling, you know, because nobody can see this coming when the person with BPD shows up, right? It's just, it's just not apparent. I mean, you know now, but people can't know the very first time. That's, that's straight up for real. The only people that know in the beginning are the very lower percentage of humanity now that actually have healthy boundaries because they had relatively healthier childhoods and they will walk away it, like without needing to go through it. But that is a really low percentage of the population today. And Wheels, uh, thanks, AJ. The support means a lot. can be hard to learn to live with the fact that you lived. Um, yes, I honestly needed to hear that. Well, you're valuable. You were born. You came here. I believe God had something to do with that, too. And that was meant to be. And you are important. And you are worthy. And, and screw the cycle for whatever other narrative they have. because. You are worthy and, and you have purpose and meaning here. And I hope you can just have that as a mantra or write that down and remind yourself something to that effect because you need to keep reminding yourself that, you know, you deserve to live. That's why you've lived. And you've had to fight to live. I know that. But your fight was one for what was always meant to be for you, and that is to live. Lisa, my ex told me that he needed a mother for his children. I think he needed a mother for himself, yes, as well. He made grievous errors with his children, himself, and with me. Joe Friendly, glad you're on the platform, AJ. Thank you so much. And, uh, you know, I, I used to wonder why you redact your messages but or retract, but I don't even care anymore, except the one I missed, darn. But, uh, yeah, because, you know, I have read them, and they're on the record in the... Uh, in the live stream for other people to benefit from your wisdom so and i and you have your own reasons for why you do that and that's fine i just really like just can't tell you enough how much i appreciate when you come to a live stream and add your wisdom in joe friendly it's it's so helpful to so many people and so it's very kind of you to do and um uh, you said uh, also glad you're not a reptilian human hybrid yeah no i'm definitely not that um <laughs> you said uh that guy is straight up nuts yeah well i don't know who you're talking about but i hear you yeah um just saying because you know what i'm saying uh i know but i guess a lot of people see that differently into each of their own so anyway what can you do and i'm not saying anything about anybody in particular because it wouldn't be wise and Yes, if I go any further with the sentence, it will be unwiser, but I hear you. And thank you. You used to thank you to me, and I want to thank you, Joe Friendly, for uh, what you shared and what you said there, because, yes, I'm, I'm not that, nor am I like that reference. And the reference, yes, people will have to learn things for themselves. And that can be said about many. And some people would argue, ooh, watch out for me, too, just saying. The trolls have their own narrative, so hey, it is what it is. Anyway, I hope this will be helpful. I hope it was helpful to people here. Hope it will. <laughs> I know Joe Friend needs to totally understand. Thank you. Um, MC, thanks for responding to me, AJ. It's been tough. It feels like I lost a, a self-aware best friend. 
sometimes I find myself wondering if he did the mature thing to end the relationship. Well, even if he's the one that ended the relationship, whether he told you or whether he ghosted you, I would say if he told you and explained it to you, that might be different. But I don't think it really comes out of maturity. It comes out of their need to evacuate, to escape what they're actually going through inside, which is repetition, compulsion, triggered emotional dysregulation, and sometimes age regression, etc. It's all that is from their past. It flies into the here and now dissociativity. So I wouldn't really attribute, not to be hard, too hard on people with BPD, but you can't really attribute emotional maturity to that. And then you said, and my emotional confusion was unfounded. But that's probably my problem, taking on too much responsibility. Well, yes, and that's what people with codependency tend to do around people with BPD or even narcissists, but quickly, because the roots of that are in childhood, and it's not the first time in your life you've ever done it, but you might consciously not be aware of that in most people's cases, right? So it's it's really sad to tragic in many of our childhoods, whether people end up with a diagnosis of BPD or not, that trauma response that is BPD that will be proven to be the correct terminology any day now outside of North America for sure. Um, but even people with codependency and what hurt someone in their life and childhood that created the roots and the quote programming of codependency. In other words, without doing this consciously, family of origin puts children into roles with injunctions, etc., that are taken on as personal narratives and, and, and negative core beliefs that then lead people to believe that healthy love is overgiving, healthy love is overcaring, healthy love is abandoning oneself. You can't be loved enough. You're not worthy of enough love if you're not getting practically only crumbs if that for all that you're giving. So it's an externalization of a woundedness in childhood to varying degrees for people that doesn't go as deep as the wounding trauma that, quote, is known as BPD, unquote. So, and, and what I think is really exciting about what the world is pioneering and ICD-11 will be evidenced of and the studies that are backed up done outside of North America will be evidence of is we're going to blow this narrative of personality disorder out of the water because Personality disorder, mental illness in America, where it started as a big industry, is, as Tom Zaz first said, a false construct. And believe me, it is. And maybe people think I'm crazy for saying it, but I'm going to keep on saying it because I'm keeping it real. And that's what it is. And I've had clients come along, you know, they, they've told me, I thought you were crazy. I didn't get what you were saying. I thought you just sounded like you wanted to sound like a know-it-all, and I don't, and I don't say I know it all at all. Um, I really am a humble person, so the trolls don't agree, but like, you know. But the thing is, then clients will say to me, but now I get it, because maybe they hit a Facebook group of like hundreds of thousands of people who know what I know, and many other professionals know what I know. And there are pioneers in this field of trauma, and what is trauma, and BPD is a trauma response. And mental illness is a false construct. So, you know, we need to see it this way because you have to separate out the person when you can with BPD. Not, not when you're in the relationship, not when you're still grieving, not when you're still hurting or wanting them back. But when you're no contact, you've gotten into your own healing recovery journey, you get more firmly on your own feet, then you need to separate out the person from what they did only for your own sake going forward. Because the people who are online vilifying people with BPD or NPD or any, I, you know, psychopathy is different, but it ain't a personality disorder. But anybody, you know, with personality disorders, etc., and this false construct of mental illness, it doesn't look at human context. And I'm not saying anybody should stay with anybody who's abusing them because there's a human context to what's going on. No, 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 not at all. But it's important not to get stuck like so many online in vilifying to somehow feel better it doesn't help people heal it doesn't help people grow and it's a big part of the stigma against the trauma response known as quote the personality disorder called quote bpd unquote 
Anyway, it was great. Take care, and I am out now, so I'll just say peace out.